inspiration to the Second Powers Podcast, where we're living life with no walls. Today, you will be hearing the teachings of our spiritual guide, Regina L. Stillman. If you'd like to learn more about the fellowship, check out our Facebook page at www.facebook.com backslash restoration2. Also, if you'd like to make a donation, go to Givenify.com and look for us at Restoration 2 or Cash App us at dollar sign R2 Power. Now, everybody, throw your twos up and let's get lifted! Ho! development of morality and in a day and time when so many people have so many opinions and ideas about people's behaviors what's right what's wrong um, the comparison of what a lot of us were taught at church was wrong uh, and then as we grow and mature and develop we begin to realize what we were taught was wrong is not necessarily wrong um, and then even to the extent that some of us were taught things that were right, that were wrong. So you have this uh, dilemma, if you will, of moral development that I want to look at today. I want to go to the scripture, St. John, the eighth chapter, and uh, that's going to be where I'm going to draw uh, from the text of scripture to discuss today as far as moral development. And I'm really asking you to um, take a personal assessment of yourself and identify where do you fall on the spectrum. Um, and so with that, let's go to John chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto, him, unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And I'm ending there at the 12th verse. I love the beauty of Jesus uh, in that he knew exactly uh, all of the details intimately of what was going on here because he did have the spiritual insight by the spirit man that was connected to the spirit to know exactly the intents and minds of the people's hearts and their own um, behaviors themselves. So he of all was able to judge a righteous judgment. And I love the beauty of him saying, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. So. When we look at that, 
I want to challenge us on our ability to look at where we are on our developmental scale of uh, moral development. I know that a lot of times we all want to think that we are uh, fully developed and, you know, I, I'm, I'm at a place where uh, I'm, if you will, at moral perfection. Uh, but I want to challenge this based on uh, Kohlberg. Kohlberg was someone who actually did a study of moral development. And I want to go and kind of cover some of the material from Kohlberg's um, concepts. So Kohlberg, and, and this is all taken from, uh, you can go to some literature, you can go online and Google it, whatever you want to do. Uh, Kohlberg's uh, teachings are very, very heavily, uh, widely known and held uh, within the psychological community, psychology, sociology, uh, so you won't have a difficult time finding the information. But Kohlberg basically holds that there are three uh, developmental levels of moral development. The first one is a pre-moral, uh, the second one is conventional, and the last one is post-conventional. Again, pre-moral, conventional, and post-conventional. Those are the three levels that he talks about. So to address the issue, and I haven't forgotten where I am in this scripture, but I want to, to digress here for a moment to get into some real uh, concepts to help you see where you are in your development uh, morally. They create what they call the Heinz Dilemma. And the Heinz Dilemma is this. There is a person, Mr. Hines, that has a wife who is dying from cancer and is told she will not make it through the night, but there is a medicine that she can take that will save her life. So Mr. Hines uh, goes to the doctor, uh, or I'm sorry, goes to the, the chemist and the pharmacist, and he asks for this particular drug. And so the chemist who's able has all of the ingredients, everything he needs to provide Mr. Hines this drug, tells Mr. Hines he's gonna charge him 10 times the cost of what it would take to actually make that drug, to which Mr. Hines does not have that money. So herein lies the dilemma. The doctors say there is a medicine that can save Mr. Hines' wife's life, uh, but she must have it. Mr. Hines goes to the chemist or uh, the pharmacist and asks for the drug and well within the pharmacist's ability to make the drug, he tells Mr. Hines he'll sell it to him at 10 times the cost, which Mr. Hines does not have. So then Mr. Hines then begs the chemist, can I make payment arrangements? The chemist, no cash on hand, money on demand when you receive the product. Uh, he pleads, he begs, he goes through every kind of reasonable means of asking the chemist to allow him to have that drug uh, to save his wife's life, but to no avail. So ultimately at the end of the day, Mr. Hines is completely turned down by the pharmacist uh, to provide this drug that can save Mr. Hines' wife's life. So at the end of the day, the story is that Mr. Hines uh, breaks in later on and steals the drug and takes it back to his wife and saves his wife's life. So here we have the moral dilemma. Was Mr. Hines wrong because he stole uh, the medication to save his wife's life, which was against the law? So let's look at it, and, and I'm going to go through the developmental stages here um, so that you can clearly see and hopefully identify where do you fall on this spectrum? Because my whole goal here is not to look at other people and point fingers at who's where. My whole goal here is to hopefully prick you uh, to assess yourself and see where you fall uh, on this spectrum to see your personal development and morality. Because this is the thing that I want to propose. 
So much of our church's teachings are so elementary and basic, we never get to greater levels of development in our moral uh, dilemmas and issues. Jesus proposes something here in the act with this woman that was taken in the very act. And of course, we can always go back to the old conversation that has always plagued feminist theology. Where was the man? Because if she was taken in the act, there had to be a man that was with her committing the act as well. But he was loosed and set free and never even brought to the table uh, because of his gender. But I'm not even going to go there. I just want you to just kind of deal with where are you in this developmental level? So pre-moral is obedience and punishment. Younger children or very uh, limited and immature or, or lowly developed uh, thinking in development is this. Rules are absolute. Rules are absolute. So this is what you typically would see with younger children or people that have not developed very far in their moral development. And that position is going to be absolutely Mr. Hines was wrong because he stole and stealing is, uh, you know, everything is about absolutes. Um, the fact that he stole is absolutely wrong that he stole. Can't think any farther than that. That's as far as I can go. Okay. That's in pre-moral development. So that's something that if that's where your thinking tends to lie, you're still in that younger childlike state. As you get older, and possibly coming to the teen level. Then we get into individualism and exchange. Uh, and that's the understanding that rules are not necessarily always rigid and rules are not necessarily always right. And so in this level of thinking, people that ascribe to the idea the druggist was unfair and so Mr. Hines was correct, that's still in that pre-moral level of development of your morality. Then we go to the conventional level. Um, this is going to be more for young adults. Um, and, and you're pushing good interpersonal relationships. You're looking at how does it imp impact the family? How does it impact the community? How uh, does it deal with trust and compassion? And so in this level, people are going to say Mr. Hines was right just from the compassionate level of uh, he did this to save his wife's life and, and the greater compassionate level of looking at the community. Um, and, and, and from that perspective, he was moral. He was correct. He was right in stealing the drug and giving it to his wife. Then we have those in this uh uh, same category and level of development. Again, we're still talking about that mid-range uh, young adult level or mid-range development, uh, even if you don't ascribe age to it, of thinking uh, and development in your morality. And that's emphasis on social order and social system. So these are the ones that get really caught up in, well, I see the dilemma, but by not following the law, we can create social chaos. And to them, Mr. Hines was still wrong because by disobeying the law, if everybody took it upon themselves to disobey that law, then we're going to have social chaos. We're going to have dilemmas on our hands. Uh, even though, yes, he saved his wife's life, if everybody takes it upon themselves to behave in that way, then we're just going to see the world unravel as we know it. Uh, so again, we're still talking about people that are still in that mid-level range of uh, moral development. Post-conventional uh, is going to be that higher level, that higher level, and, and really one of the highest levels of where you are in your development. That deals with social contracts and individual rights. So people understand that there could be multiple perspectives and multiple types of societies. There can be multiple perspectives and multiple types of society. There's no simple definition to a good or bad society. Uh, human rights and laws all have different aspects. And Mr. Hines ultimately was right because he saved a life. And the saving of a life, high, it, 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 it so far outranks um, the law the rightness or wrongness of the law. That law, when it's between saving a human life and the law, uh, the law is, is bumped. 
Um, and also we're looking at people who have the their own moral guidelines that looking at which may not agree with society and people act accordingly and defend those principles. So um, if I wanted to go even a little further and, and I'm using some aids here, you see me looking down uh, because I'm, I'm wanting to, to bring in some other materials. So if I'm looking at that uh, highest level, then these would be uh, for those that really understand the moral dilemma that human life and my moral decision goes way farther than what the law says because the law as it uh, 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 applies to individuals the law in itself could be unjust so we look at the holocaust was legal uh, and there was a time when hiding the jews was criminalized but for those who would have been operating at at this post uh level of development in their morality they could not embrace the idea that the holocaust was legal and the crime that was being committed against these people and although hiding of the jews was criminalized they did it anyway um slavery was legal and freeing the slaves became criminalized for those that were helping people to be free um, but there's something in a higher level of morality that even though the law may say one thing, uh, my, my level of morality uh, is at a different place from the law and I have to be ruled and governed by what I genuinely believe. The time when segregation uh, was legal. And so protesting racism was criminalized and we know uh, many of those that went to jail for our rights as people of color, uh, our history there and, and how they were criminalized and beaten uh, and all sorts of terrible things enacted upon them. And what they were doing at the time was actually breaking the law, but the law was unjust. All of these are elements and examples of what I'm saying. When you get to that highest level of morality, where it's not about, oh, society's going to go into chaos. Uh, we, we, we just need to keep doing what we're doing and stop rocking the boat because it's going to create all sorts of dilemmas within uh, the status quo as we know it. Uh, we know that there are times that the status quo needs to be shaken up. And so this is just that friendly reminder that legality isn't always our guide to morality. Again, legality is not always our guide to morality. So this even becomes an issue yet and still within the church because the church wants to have our own religious legal system uh, within the constructs and confines of the different denominations that you go to. You're going to find all of these different elements of what they legally uh, agree with and what they do not agree with and thereby uh, consider that an infraction of their particular uh, legal rules and regulations. Um, all of which, if we want to be truthful, they want to utilize the idea that what the Bible says. Well, I wanted to come to this particular story of the woman because uh, her being taken in adultery, who brought the woman to Jesus? The scribes, uh, that's a religious sect. And the Pharisees, that's a religious sect. So the church is bringing this woman to Jesus for his judgment as to her being taken in the very act of adultery. Uh, and they're expecting him to operate in those lower levels of right and wrong, like a child, the absolutes. Uh, she was taken in adultery and then they want to bring the judgment to be imposed along with that. And the Bible says that uh, by rights, she should be stoned and put to the death. Uh, so here again, we have in the lower level, uh, the absolutes of a childlike level of development, right and wrong, black and white thinking, it's all or nothing. This woman was taken in the act. She absolutely is wrong because she was caught in adultery. She absolutely should be stoned to the death. Again, that's childlike. That, that's when we're talking about little kids. Then we have those that, well, you know, I know that uh, uh, 
uh, there, there may have been some extenuating circumstances, but if we let her get away with it, then it's going to upset our whole system of living. And, you know, we, we just can't let that one uh, get by because once you let one do it, everybody's going to want to feel like they can do it. Uh, our system and social order to our denomination, our system and social order uh, to our particular religious sect is going to be upset. You're going to upset the fruit basket if you let her get away with it. So, you know, she still needs to be stoned. We see Jesus not stopping at any of those levels because he understood the greater level. And that greater level is that you've got to get to a place where you're able to look at things with individuals and um, the societal system that's set in order. Is that system by and of itself right? Is that system righteous? If the system is not right, and if the system is not righteous, I don't care what the law is. When you begin to move at that higher level, you begin to move based upon what is genuinely right and wrong and principle. What is the principle? Am I able to look at the principle? And even recently, I've seen so many things within so many churches where if you look at, oh, I want to pull out a scripture and the scripture says this. And so this person was wrong. Or I want to uh, not upset the system of this organization, so we're going to squash that. When you begin to operate in those realms, you're still operating in lower levels of uh, morality. And we've got to understand that to get to the post-conventional realm where we really understand principle, you've got to really challenge people based on their principles. And we've got to live our life by principle. You know, let us get every man be persuaded in his own mind. I need you to get a full persuasion. What is it that you really believe? And then live by that principle, not somebody else's rule, not somebody else's regulation, not even by scripture, because the Bible tells us that the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Sometimes we need to back up and really get the spirit of what it was that was being said versus the letter. Because the letter, if it's almost like, I'll put it in today's um, terms, there are conversations you don't need to have via text. Because when you text it, when I read that text from you, I get a totally different context of what you meant from that text. There are some conversations that really, even above and beyond um, telephone, there are some conversations you need to have face to face. Some conversations so you can get the fullness of everything that was meant in that conversation. It needs to be done no other way but face to face. So when we start coming into uh, morality and the development in these other levels at post-conventional level, I'm saying there are some things that you got to deal with. Jesus dealt with that woman face to face. Jesus dealt with those people face to face. I'm not going to text it to you. I'm not going to read the letter of the law. I'm not going to have some other level of whatever uh, you want to put in there. We're going to deal with this face to face. Okay, first face to face, let's deal with the accusers. You that are without sin, cast the first stone. You that are so holy and so righteous, cast the first stone. You, and again, we're talking about scribes and Pharisees. So they knew the law. The scribes were the writers. They were the ones that wrote it down and passed it on. Pharisees, they were known for being so strict by the law, letter to letter, dot every I, cross every T. That's the whole segment of the Pharisee sect. So you guys that want to come with all of this, wah, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you that are without sin, you cast the first stone. And what do we find? From the oldest to the youngest, they had to walk away. Because what? They knew they wasn't all that. And they knew that they were guilty. And they knew they did not have any right to accuse her and want to impose justice and sentencing on her. Unless they're going to impose justice and sentencing on themselves. As the Bible says, judge not so you won't be judged. Judge not so you won't be judged. And the same way that you judge is the way that you're going to be judged. So here we have Jesus dismantling that uh, moral issue of her being caught and taken in the act of adultery by number one, telling them to look at themselves. 
Then again, hands on, not by letter, not by some other means, but very directly. He deals with her specifically and directly. Where are your accusers? I have none. Neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. And so here we have the essence of looking at where and how Jesus went so far above and beyond just that moral dilemma of the woman taken in the act of adultery. And this is the thing I find a lot of times, even with my ministry, because my ministry is embracing and loving and uh, people like to try to track me and trip me up in different questions about what I believe about this and that and the other. The thing that I say all the time, what, I'm, what I believe doesn't matter. It's always about what you believe. I espouse myself to the same things that I see Jesus talk about, the same things I hear Jesus preach about. Those are the things that I talk about and preach about. Uh, I do it all with love. I do it all with compassion. I do it all post-conventionally in my moral development. I do it post-conventionally in my moral development. I'm not a little kid that's locked into absolute uh, right and wrong. Uh, I'm not in that younger teen development level of uh, understanding family, community, and relationships, but still uh, very, very concerned about upsetting social, uh, creating social chaos uh, by moving in a way that rubs people the wrong way. I'm not moved by any of that. I'm encouraging you as well in your spiritual development. I want you to begin to uh, assess yourself and do introspection. There's nothing about trying to look at the other person outside and say, oh, that's where you are. Oh, that's where you are. It's all about introspection. It's all about looking within yourself. Where do I fall on the spectrum? Am I at uh, pre-conventional? Am I at conventional or am I post-conventional uh, morality? Where am I at? Am, am I at pre-conventional? Again, little kids, absolute right and wrong. Uh, yes and no, black and white thinking. Am I at conventional where I understand community, family, compassion, and begin to look a little bit farther and and and, and can embrace more than just the, the pre-conventional black and white thinking? Uh, am I still in that uh, conventional where I'm so concerned about creating chaos in the larger picture that even though I may feel like, let's go back to Mr. Hines, I may go back to feeling that Mr. Hines was right for getting his wife the uh, medicine so that she can live. My final verdict, however, is that ultimately he was wrong because he stole the medicine and stealing is against the law. And if we start letting people steal, we're going to have absolute chaos in our social structure. Uh, am I still stuck there or am I able to go to a post-conventional level where I really begin to understand that, um, you know, I, I, Mr. Hines, number one, saved the life of his wife. Mr. Hines uh, was being unjustly treated by someone that had the means to give life and the power to allow medicine to be given to his wife uh, to give her and save and spare her life. Uh, but for whatever means of you, if I go to America today in our capitalistic society, uh, I can make a bigger profit if I don't give it to you. Either you give me 10 times the money or your wife dies. Uh, you can't put it on credit. You can't make payments on it. You can't work it off in some kind of labor exchange. You got to give me 10 times right now just because I'm greedy. Um, and so being able to see Mr. Hines's reaction to that in stealing the medicine to save his wife's life. Uh, and, you know, let's even say and add to it that once he got the means by which to pay the pharmacist back, let's add that after his wife was saved, he paid the pharmacist back. You know, uh, there was nothing in Mr. Hines's story and his behavior that said he was trying to get all over on uh, the pharmacist, pharmacist at all. His priority was my wife is dying and she's going to die tonight if I don't get her this medication. It's within your means and you're being unjust towards me. And so I'm going to break an unjust law in this instance. Uh, I'm going to make a provision to save my wife's life. 
um, I'm in that post-conventional way of thinking. So some of you may agree with me, some of you may disagree because I do recognize when you're in the pre-conventional and the conventional levels, it's just almost absurdity and uh, insane to think that anything outside of that window can even be a possibility. However, I wanna challenge you today. I wanna challenge you to make an assessment. Think about the woman that was taken in the act of adultery and think about Jesus's response to her and his reaction to letting her go free, neither do I condemn thee. Uh, think about Mr. Hines. Think about Mr. Hines's dilemma. Uh, if you can put that in some level of a perspective that you can make sense of and um, identify where you are on your development, developmental level, uh, of uh, moral development. Make some assessments here and then go back and maybe start rethinking some of your uh, past belief systems and challenges.